great to be to be here. Um, it's it's a great pleasure to to talk in this in this seminar. Um, and today I'll be talking about some work that I did with a former student of mine, Tommaso Senecci, and then later with Tigran Bar Barakian and and Rita Ferreira which has to do with uh, displacement convexity inequalities in, in minfield games. And because I understand that not all of you are experts in minfield games, I'll spend a fair amount of, of time also explaining a little bit where minfield games come from and what is the relevance of, this, of, of these models. So um, the way I, I, I like to explain minfield games is something that I call the measure potential framework. And the idea is that you look at models with large populations. And uh, these, these models quite often fit the following framework. You describe the population by a probability density. And this probability density determines the population distribution. Out of this, uh, in, in many of these models, there is um, a value function or a potential or a pressure that encodes how the population affects the environment. And this, these two variables, U and M, are coupled together with a nonlinear elliptic or parabolic equation. Um, and and so, so the effects on the population on the pressure and the pressure drives the evolution of M. And, and this is exactly the, the, if you think it's the, exactly the framework of many chemotaxis models, certainly the mean field games, the Hughes model, that's another, another model that, that fits this, this kind of framework. What's special about uh, mean field games is that these are models where these agents are rational. So they are active and they seek to minimize a cost functional. Uh, and this functional depends only on statistical information on the, on the population. So these models were introduced by uh, two groups more or less simultaneously, by Keynes, Wang, and Malame in the engineering community, and by Leslie and Lyons, the more mathematical community. And what they comprise is a system of two equations, a Hamilton-Jacob equation and a transport or Fokker-Planck equation. And um, the, the difficulty on, on these models is that these equations are coupled. I, mean, I, I, I sometimes jokingly say that we know everything about hamilton jacobi equations if we know the hamilton jacobi equation. And we know everything about transport and Fokker-Planck equations if you actually know the equations. But the, the, the issue is that when this, these equations are coupled, well, then it's, it's a little bit of a different, of a different game. For example, if you look at the typical model, so we have a transport equation in this mean field game, and we have a hamilton jacobi equation. So you can think of M as the density of the population and U as a value function for a typical agent. And if you look at this, these two equations, and you say, well, what can we say about this? Well, actually not much, because really, if you don't know the drift vector field on the transport equation, well, you really cannot say much more than M is a measure, maybe a probability measure. If you don't know much about M, and think of this guy as M to some power, for example, uh, well, if, if you don't know anything about M, then there is relatively little that you can say about the, the hamilton jacobi equation. Plus, these equations have this structure where u as terminal condition, so at time t, and m as initial distribution. The reason is that, as you'll see, u is a solution of a control problem. So control problems take usually terminal values because you want to optimize something towards the future, but you know the distribution of agents at the beginning of time. So part of the variables go forward, part of the variables go backward in time, and this creates one of the difficulties. So, so things like um, Koshikovalevsk, uh, local time existence kind of results are, are, are not available, at least for an OST is very small. So let, let me start by reviewing a little bit where the, the Hamilton-Jacobi equations come from. 
So let's fix a terminal time and fix an agent whose state is uh, X of T. Uh, and well, what agents can do, as I said, agents in mutual games are active agents, so they can choose a bounded measurable uh, control. And they, well, in this simple model, they just act on their velocities. Um, now we have a cost. When they choose velocities, they pay a price. And this price is aggregated in time by a running cost, which depends on their position, depends on their velocity, and they face a terminal cost, capital U. Now, uh, and, and, and the agents want to minimize, and what's well known in the uh, theory of optimal control is the following. You build the Legendre transform of the Hamiltonian. So for example, if my Lagrangian were V squared over two, then the Hamiltonian would be P squared over two, as it is well known. So you build the Legendre transform. And in this Legendre transform, you, the, the maximum or the supreme is achieved as a, as a unique point. Um, and we have something called a verification theorem. And the verification theorem tells you the following. If you solve the corresponding hamilton jacob equation with uh, the appropriate terminal conditions, then you can build optimal trajectories in feedback form, meaning you give me the X, I'll tell you where you should go, um, out of the solution of the hamilton jacob equation. So two things, you solve the hamilton jacob equation, then what you gain is an optimal feedback and you tilde or your solution is the value function in your, in your control problem. Now, but this is what one agent does. What, what happens with when you have a crowd of agents? Well, when you have a crowd of agents and they are following, let's say a vector field, that's about the simplest example. Well, a vector field induces a flow, which is simply the map that takes initial conditions into conditions at time t. So you give me an ODE, I can build a flow. This flow maps the initial conditions to the solution at later times. And once you have a flow, then you have what's called the push forward, uh, which is a map that takes probability measures and, and builds other probability measures in, let's say, the only possible way. You take an initial density for agents, right? You have M0 of X, and then you see where the agents are at time T and you integrate. And this defines a probability measure or probability density, depending on, on smoothness, um, at, at later times. And then you ask, well, but can we give a character? Because in principle, if you have a smooth enough flow, you can use change of variables formula and get the formula for M of X T. But in fact, what we are interested in characterizing what happens in terms of differential equations and what happens is that if you have a Lipschitz vector field, then you consider the push, the push forward by the flow and then the corresponding density, in fact, is a weak solution of the transport equation. And of course, if you have more regularity, then you can push it further. Um, now, so, so what I told you so far is what a single agent does, solves a control problem, and what happens when a crowd follows a vector field. But then you can ask, well, what happens if every agent is solving a, a control problem that depends on the probability distribution of the agents, and, and all of them do the same thing? Well, what you get is you have a distribution of agents, you have a distribution of agents, you have a cost that depends on the distribution of agents, and agents seek to minimize a control problem involving this cost, they get a hamilton jacob equation, and out of this hamilton jacob equation, they know where to go. 
uh, because the, you, you know their optimal strategy. Out of these two things, you get the system that couples Hamilton Jacob equations with transport equations in, in this case. And, and of course, you can get second order equations, second order Hamilton Jacob equations, if you, um, uh, if, if you look at instead of ODEs, stochastic differential equations, and so on. But um, what, what I, I want you, and, and because mo most of our results are, in fact, for first order mean field games. This, this is uh, something that um, uh, we don't need to go to go into for, for the purposes of this of this talk. Um, now this problem you are given with initial conditions on M and terminal conditions on U. And anyway so well, look this is a nightmare in terms of, of regularity theory because Standard theory of Hamilton Jacob equation tells you that U is going to be Lipschitz. And well, this guy is DPH evaluated at DU, right? So if you have um, U Lipschitz, then this is going to be bounded and bounded is not such a nice regularity for the transport equation. So, so it's even doubtful that you can get a decent kind of existence result. Um, but, but you'll see that in fact, there are cases where, where you can. And, and in our case, we have Hamiltonians with a specific form, which have, uh, I mean, think of P square over two as, as something that's uniformly convex. Um, we have, so, so this guy corresponds to a, a cost of moving it, which in this case is going to be V square. Um, so agents pay a price, which in this particular example is quadratic in, in terms of cost of moving. Uh, but then they have preferences about where they are, and this is encoded in a potential. And then if you have a function that's increasing, um, well, what, what you have is that, so this is the Hamiltonian. At the level of the Lagrangian, you get plus G of M because you switch the sign between the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian. And if you have plus G of M, um, what you have is that, and G is increasing, this means that your agents are crowd averse. Okay. Um, now, this problem actually arose quite before mean field games. And, uh, and, and, and let me show you something that I'm, I'm sure many of you are, are aware, which is the uh, Benamou-Brenier formulation of optimal transport. So it's a seemingly unrelated problem, which is this, you are given two probability measures and you seek to transport one probability into the other, meaning you want to find a map that pushes forward one probability measure into the, the other that minimizes um, minimizes the, the, the transportation cost, let's say a quadratic transportation cost. Um, and, and, and you know, this problem has a, has a quite long story from Kantorovich, McCann, Brenier, Villani. And, and I'm sure there is some one in the audience that made important contributions. I apologize, your name is not, is, is not here, but, but this, this is actually a, a, a very long, very long history. And, the benamou brenier formulation is a continuous formulation of this optimal transport. And the idea is this, well, instead of minimizing the one shot transport cost, what they realize is that you can say, well, take a velocity vector field and minimize this kinetic energy term, let's say, subject to the flow corresponding to V pushing forward M0 into M1. And, and 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 at all intermediate at all intermediate times. Now, if you look at what are the optimality conditions for this variational problem, well, they are in fact a mean field game, uh, except that there is no coupling between these two equations. So so there, the 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 Hamilton Jacobi equation and the the um, the Fokker-Planck equation or the transport equation are uncoupled or, or it's not true. They are, the Hamilton-Jacob equation does not depend on M. Of course, this equation depends on M. 
but they have some triangular structure. And, and there is something interesting because if you solve this optimality uh, pair, let's say, then you get the velocity field as the gradient of the, the Hamilton Jacob equation, as you would get in a standard uh, verification, verification theorem. Um, there is only one thing uh, that if you have never seen it, you'll find it puzzling, which is this. You are given M as the beginning at end and end, right? But you are not given any condition for you. So this is a problem where you, your problem really is this, you try to find what is the cost that you can impose, what is the terminal cost that you can impose so that agents distributed according to M0 will reorganize themselves as agents distributed according to M1. And um, uh, as, as I pointed out, this is uh, this problem has been looked in the mean field game theory, and it's called the planning problem. Uh, and, and it's a very similar problem where you also give only initial and terminal conditions for M, and you don't give initial nor terminal conditions for U. And you ask, well, can we find a terminal cost such that these rational agents self-organized uh, and starting from you end up as new. And this is called the, the planning, planning problem. Now, uh, th this problem was introduced by Lyons in his lectures in Collège de France. It has been studied by a number of authors um, from variational methods by Ashtu, Camille, Graber, Bezaros, uh, Sylvain Tonon. Uh, these are two separate papers, by the way. Um, the parabolic case was studied by Alessio, Alessio Porretta. Um, Lavena and Santambrogio actually studied this problem and established uh, estimates that are related to, to the ones that we'll discuss here. And Munoz, there is an N missing. Uh, established the existence of solutions when there is no, uh, no potential, but, and, and we'll address that, that later on. Um, okay. So let me explain uh, the key question that we want to understand. And, and, and if you want to get the most general, general results, uh, you'll need to go to the, to the paper. I'll try to give you some ideas in the examples and explain why this, um, these are uh, important points. But our, our key question is this, you consider a planning problem and you ask, well, can we uh, prove that if we start with probability densities on the torus, on let's say one dimensional torus to fix ideas, can we get that M is strictly positive everywhere? And the reason why, um, and certainly this is an interesting question and uh, more generally, another question that maybe you want to, to answer and, and we'll show <coughs> how to do this is, Given bounds on M0, given bounds on MT, can we prove bounds on M at intermediate times? And, and, and this is not obvious, right? Because you don't know what the terminal conditions for you are. So, so really proving bounds at intermediate times for M when you know M0 and MT um, seems a bit of magic because you, you don't know part of the, the boundary conditions. Let me explain why these bounds or the lower bounds are relevant in particular. I, I guess getting bounds at intermediate times is, is clear why um, this would be interesting from the point of view of PDEs. But from the um, from point of view of these lower bounds, it's, it's an observation by Lyons that if you look at this problem when V is zero, so no potential, you can take the first equation and say, well, look, I can take the first equation and this tells me what M is, right? I mean, in general, you have a G of M, but in principle, you can invert uh, because G is a monotone function. Um, but, but when M, I, I know what M is, so I can use this in the second equation and I get, well, some expression, which I reorganized. 
And you see that if M is positive, then the previous equation is elliptic, right? Is uniformly uniformly elliptic. So 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 definitely this this is something that we would expect that we to get some some regularity theory. Uh, now, what do we expect in terms of, of lower bounds for M? Um, and, and the answer is, well, yes, we have lower bounds for M if V is zero. Uh, and, and this is what we want to address. The maybe here, well, it's actually the answer is, is yes. And these bounds are false if V has large oscillation. And, and the reason why uh, the potential plays a role is the following. If you have, think of the potential as the, the V as being your spatial preferences. So if V has high oscillation, it means that there are, well, good places and bad places. And the more the oscillation of V, the more different the good places are from, from the bad differences. So it's not completely implausible that agents will just avoid some regions, period. Right? If, if there are regions that are so bad that, that people will just avoid it, then you'll have. And, and, and in fact, this is something that you can see in examples. And, and, and let me give you just two examples. One is a stationary case. And, and you see uh, that really, if you look at this second equation, either by just staring at it. So everything is periodic. So my solutions in this talk are periodic solutions, um, as, as, as I put the torus before, but just to be clear, if you look at this equation, you say, well, look, if we are talking about classical solutions, then u equals zero is going to be a solution of this, this equation for free, for inspection. And in fact, is the only possible solution because if you if you take this equation you you realize that the gradient of u has to be zero um has to be zero uh and unless m m is zero now if u is zero sorry then you go to this equation so well but this is zero then well then i know what m is right but if i know what m is then this is what I want. And look, if let's say for normalization, I ask M to be a probability measure and I can always add a constant to V so that its integral is zero. It doesn't change the oscillation. You get that M equals one plus V. And, and, and now you see that you have a contradiction if V has a high oscillation, because if V has a high oscillation, then M can have negative can take negative values and this would be a this would be a serious a serious problem so so this model shows uh, that i mean it it's re it's really not a counter example because this is a stationary case and what i want is i start with some m0 i end up with m0 and want to ask is in between m0 right and and this is not the answer that i'm giving to you but but this is somehow some plausibly plausible plausible plausibly check, right? Um, so, so then we start, well, can we build time-dependent examples? And, 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 and this is a nice way to build examples because you build the answer and then you figure out the equation. Um, so, so what we did was the following thing. We started with an M that vanishes. And, and of course, you, by, by inspection, you can see it's zeros. And then you say, well, look, but now we have MT uh, sorry, minus m, m t minus m u x sub x equals zero. So if you put m in, into this equation, you may be able to solve for u, and you need to believe me that this is what you get. You get u, and you say, well, but what about the hamilton jacobi equation? Oh, the hamilton jacobi equation is this. So this gives you the v, right? And what you realize is that this v is going to be unbounded. Right, so, so uh, but, but, but you can have at least with V unbounded solutions for which M vanishes, right? And it's not so far-fetched to, to think that, that these things can happen, um, can happen in, in some other way. So um, the, the key observation and, and is, is that the way to prove 
lower bounds on M is to try to understand what happens to integral functions of, of M or, or some density. So, so this should be M, by the way. So, so a displacement, so you take two probability measures and you ask, well, what happens to functionals uh, of M at intermediate times? And this is something that was studied by, by McCann uh, to study gas models in the context of, of optimal transport. And they actually showed that along solutions, I mean, it, I, I guess he didn't show uh, along solutions of Benamou Prenier problem because Benamou Prenier problem is, is was afterwards, but but this this is really what, what happens. Along solutions of uh, Benamou Prenier problem, you have a number of potentials that are convex. And, and this is called displacement, displacement convexity. For example, interaction potentials or internal energies with appropriate conditions on on you. So our goal is to identify functions such that this function is convex where M solves first order mean field games. See, if you have a convex function that is bounded by below, so let's say I have zero, I have capital T, I have my integral of U of M. And I know I'm zero, so I know this guy here. I know this guy at the terminal time. I know, presumably, that this function is convex in time, so I can bound it by a line. If I know that this functional is bounded by below, then that's it. I mean, this, this functional here is going to be bounded for all times in between zero and capital T by only the initial data. And it turns out, as we'll see, that, in fact, it's you have things like the LP norms or one over M and so on are displacement, displacement convex. And this gives you a number of, of bounds for these problems. And uh, for optimal transport, the condition is this. Essentially, you, you take the Legendre transform of this potential and you ask when is this, I guess, pressure uh, non-decreasing. And if you are in dimension one, for example, powers like z to the power q will work provided that q is less than zero or q is greater than, than one. Um, so as I, as I said, convexity of the internal energy uh, gives that the, the internal energy is, is bounded at intermediate times. For example, an example, is the L2 norm at xt, or the square of the L2 norm, is bounded by the L2 norm at t uh, times the L2 norm at zero. Uh, so, so, so you gain bounds almost out of, uh, well, I guess it's not out of nothing because there is a fair amount of work to prove displacement convexity. So, for and and it turns out and this is something that I did with Tommaso Tommaso Senechi who was my my student um, is that in fact if you have potentials that satisfy McCann's condition then you have displacement convexity for the for the mean field games um, and and really the proof is you differentiate uh, and and you integrate by parts. And, and I'll get back to the end if, if we have if we have time. Um, so 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 you integrate by parts and, and, and you reorganize reorganize your your identities in a, in a clever way. Um, one thing that we obtained also and, and, and this is interesting is the the bounds also for mean field games with congestion. So mean field games with congestion corresponds to problems where the Lagrangian this L tilde is m to the alpha l of v, let's say. So, so you have a situation where moving in high density areas is expensive. It's more expensive than, than what you would expect. And, um, and, and this is something where you can also get this, this same box. Now, um, what's... 
Now, these bounds require actually a fair amount of integration by parts. Uh, and, and, and certainly in the case of these mean field games, um, because actually a posteriori, Sebastian Munoz proved that, uh, actually the story is Lyons sketched in his lectures in Collège de France that this system was well posed and the solutions are smooth. Smooth means C2 something. Um, and, and then Sebastian Munoz actually proved and wrote a nice, a nice proof of, of, of this thing. And, and so this, I'm not sure if the paper has been published, but it's, it's available on, online. So, so all of these computations can be actually uh, properly, properly justified. Uh, what he didn't prove and, and we'll address at the end is the case with the potential. Because in the cases of potential, you, you actually need uh, displacement convexity to prove the existence of solutions. Um, so, so, so what we did in the in the um, in, in in this thing with with Tommaso is we realized that we could extend displacement convexity, and in fact, the logarithm of some functions is convex also. Uh, so, so. We, we could prove that the logarithm of some of these, these LP norms, let's say, is, is, in fact, is in fact convex because we have well, identities that, that give you that the logarithm of integral of M to the Q is convex. And if you have this, then you can take the Q root of, the the or you can take the exponential and then you can take the q root of of what convexity of the logarithm gives you and obtain that in fact the lq norms as claimed in the in the theorem um satisfy this inequality here and in this inequality you can pass q to infinity so in fact you obtain um, you obtain a bound that, um, that that's valid up to L infinity. So you can get uniform bounds on M. And, and this means that in it, it's, this is kind of a natural result if you think about this, because these agents are crowd averse. And this means that, well, if you start with the agents reasonably well distributed, they will not in the, in the middle pile together and, and, and create unbounded, unbounded densities. So, uh, and, and, and then you can estimate, um, you, you can get a number, a number of, other, of other estimates uh, out, of, out of this thing. Let me just um, address the, the one, the one dimensional case. If you are in one dimension, then you can get negative bounds, the negative powers of, of Q. Um, and, and in fact, what you can do is to show that one over M is bounded. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and this requires a little bit of, of a, limiting, a limiting argument because a priori, you don't know whether one over M is, is bounded or not, but you, you, can, you, can, you can get it. Okay, so... Um, and we really explored this, this thing to a fair amount of detail and I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not expecting everyone to appreciate the, the numerology in this, in this slide, but we, we kind of understand reasonably well what are the various combinations of congestion, polynomial growth on G and, and polynomial growth on the nonlinearity, this guy that that will give you displacement, displacement convexity. So all of this, all of this could can be analyzed in a, in a fair amount of, of detail, uh, and and in particular by by the previous results, we we can also get the L infinity, L infinity bounds out of this thing. Now, the, in in this second part of the talk, what what I, what I want to address is the case of mean field games with a potential. Now, with the potential, you don't get convexity, displacement convexity directly. 
so, so, so if you try to do these computations, you don't get something positive because the, the potential still remains. And as far as I can tell, uh, I mean, the, the, the proof by Sebastian Munoz or, or the ideas of, of Lyons don't automatically give you M greater than zero, even if these guys are uh, bounded um, bounded away from, from zero at the initial and terminal and terminal time. Um, and, and somehow they cannot give it to you. I mean, the, 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 these proofs ne would need to, to be changed in, in some substantial way because it's most likely false without any conditions on, on V that, um, that you get this. So actually what we found is that there are some smallness conditions on, in, in this case is the Laplacian of V um and, and and these are two assumptions that somehow combine two things combine how large the Laplacian of v is and how large the time is and and the way to explain this is look if you if you want to avoid the region you need to move but moving is expensive right if you have a short time you need to move fast so now it's it's a game between the size of v and how much time do you have to move to avoid the region, right? And what, what our estimates somehow explain, or, or I mean, this is the explanation. I mean, what, what the estimates show is that if you have the right balance, then uh, either the time is, is small enough or what portion of these is small enough, then, then you are in, in, in business and, and you cannot have this, this areas void of agents. Um, so, so if you have this thing, then, and of course, this is a theorem under the previous assumption. So we have a potential under, uh, so under previous assumptions. Um, so, so what we can do is to prove that in fact, the LP bounds are the LP norms are bounded, and in fact, they, they, uh, if the dimension is one, we have bounds in one over M. So we have, uh, we we don't have vacuum vacuum formation. Um, let me see. So what is the key inequality? Well, the the key inequality is this: is is you keep track of what you have, and and you try to control what whatever remains that depends on V. And you get the inequality and you say, well, this really looks like an elliptic equation. Uh, and in fact, this is really what it is. It's, it's, it's an, an elliptic equation in, um, in one dimension with boundary, boundary conditions. And you ask, when can we, we get, um, when, when can we get bounds on, on this solution? And it turns out that if epsilon um, if, if C is small compared to, to epsilon and T, then you have a uniform bound on, on the solutions to this, to this, to this equation. So, so this is more or less what's, what's going on here. Um, and, and, and so out of this differential inequality, uh, what, what you gain is exactly a bound on the, on the solution. So uh, this, this gives you the, 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 the LP bounds. Um, and, and, and now let me consider a, a, special, a special example with a polynomial power here. Um, and, and then what we can do in this case is in fact show that you have both L infinity bounds and um, well, L infinity bounds in, in one over M. Uh, and the way you do it is 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 really this. Um, so, so the idea is that you first try to find a bound for something. Uh, so, so you try to find the R for which the integral one over m to some power R is bounded, and and then the key argument is an iterative argument. Okay, so let's let's go over this. Um, 
So you see, the, the thing is this, the thing is that you get the differential inequality on second derivatives. This guy is positive, so it's good. And this guy here, well, you need to cook it up in, in some way, right? So if you choose Q small enough, depending on C and T and so on, what you get is that for one R, this guy is going to be bounded. And, and then what you have is that this term here, you can use to produce some iterative inequalities. And out of these iterative inequalities, you get some, some iterations that allow you to build a sequence QN where you, you bound each guy by the, by the previous ones iteratively. And, and, and this is really where, uh, from, from where this, this result, result follows. Now, so, so the proof is similar for, for, for the L infinity, the L infinity bound. Uh, so, so in this case, the, the, um, uh, the L infinity bound, you actually get it for, for all d greater than one. And, and in fact, this is a result that's extremely related what, to what Filippo Sant'Ambrogio proved. So Filippo Sant'Ambrogio proved a similar, a similar result using a completely different method. But I, I think in the end, it's the same, same spirit, let's say, that there is some hidden convexity in, in, in these models. Um, and now, so the last, the last topic that I want to address is the existence of solutions. So a lot of what we did here was really the, the, the getting that the solutions are bounded, provided they exist, right? So in fact, what, what we realize is that what we have is these lower bounds are exactly what's needed to complement the, the work by Sebastian Munoz. And, and in this case, we can get that for um, polynomial uh, nonlinearities. You, you, get, um, you get the classical, a classical solution to this, to this planning, to this planning problem. Okay. So, so um, let me, uh, just tell you one more thing. So, so I, I put here some further credits. And um, the reason is uh, that actually I benefited a lot from working with these two people. So one was Levon Nurbeckin. And, and, and let me tell you how do we, do we came up with, the, with, um, with this displacement convexity. And it, at some point I was, I was involved in this project of um, looking at symbolic computations for PDEs. And, and what, we, what we were interested is in finding more or less automatic ways to decide when expressions can be integrated by parts to be positive. For example, uh, you have an expression like this and you want to decide, can I integrate this by parts and get, uh, in this case, a negative, a negative quantity. And it turns out, um, that this is a purely algorithmic project. And I was working with Meher Safarian in, in the implementation of this, of this code. And we were looking for an example that, that would be interesting and, and, uh, and non-trivial. And, and in fact, was, was Levon that uh, was my postdoc at, at the time and now is, is postdoc in UCLA. They said, oh, you know, you guys should, should experiment with, um, with the displacement convexity and see if you, if you can get can get something, and this is in fact how we how we get this thing. So I think I think certainly they deserve a little bit of credit, well, a fair amount of credit for 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 suggesting suggesting these ideas. So I, I think this is more or less what what I wanted to to tell you guys. Um, so I'm, if you have questions and comments, I'll be. So I see that there is a question in the. Okay, Diogo, thank you so much. Beautiful talk. So let's thank see you. if people have questions. So I see that there is one question in the, can the crowd diversion function G in the Hamiltonian be considered as an elastic potential within the Hamiltonian? 
yeah this this is really what it is right because if you um i mean it's, it's some some kind of internal potential from from the system uh that that you have some external potential that's prescribed to you if you look at the lagrangian let's say you have maybe some kinetic energy and you have a g of m of x of, of t and, the, and and this guy can um comes from 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 the internal the internal system so so in some sense that's the true what it is yeah Okay, thank you. Any further question? Diogo, uh, it's just a curiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. So for the G, so G is always, I mean, it can be thought as a potential, uh, uh, an exponent of M, right? So M mm -hmm. to some power alpha. So what happens when alpha increases or decreases? Does it improve the regularity or the, or so the, the, the bigger the alpha, the worse the regularity or vice versa? There is any interaction, clear interaction between this? So let's see. Um, it's easier to prove. So, so it's easier to prove or it's easier to prove more regularity if, if uh, the behavior at zero is more singular, actually. Mm. So, so things improve surprisingly with things like the logarithm of M. Let, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, let me, yeah, let me give you this example. So if you look at this stationary, right? Uh, Divergence of this thing equals zero. And this, this is the other Lagrange equation of the following problem. We minimize over u the integral of e to the du square over 2 plus v of x. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you take some g of du square plus v of x, and, and you consider an integral function like this, and you write down what the Lagrange equation for this thing is, is, well, in weak form is g prime uh, it's not what I want. It's g prime of this thing mm -hmm. du dv equals zero, mm -hmm. which then you can do the following game. You define this thing to be m, and then you get the divergence of m du equals zero together with uh, du square over two plus v of x equals g prime inverse of m. Because you, you, you just, I mean, there is u square over two positive effects here, right? So you just invert, invert this relation. So, so singular guys like this sometimes have a, a, a really, um, a, a really nice regularizing behavior. I mean, it, you would think that it would be much worse, right? But mm -hmm. uh, the, and 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 the meaning is this: is that if you have place, if you, if the agents love really love empty places, then there can't be empty places. Uh, I see. Okay, so uh, so so this is what the logarithm means. So if you take a, a logarithm of of zero is minus infinity. So if there is an empty place, it's an infinitely good place. So people will go there and this place won't be empty anymore. Uh, so, so that's the see. thing. In, in, interesting interpretation of the, of the regularity theory beneath the, the PDE. So there is someone asking whether I have a sample PDE and plot of the solution. Yes, uh, but not at hand. So you can, you can look at my papers with Levon and uh, Mariana Prazerch. Mm -hmm. um, and there is actually a detailed analysis of one-dimensional models. Um, there, there are a couple, I mean, there are a number of people that did numerics on midfield games. They, they probably even have better, um, better graphics and 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 numerics than me. But but if you want, let's say, a simple model where you can really understand what's what's going on in midfield games, 
then then maybe this is a good place to start. Okay, any further question? Okay, if we don't have any further question, uh, please join me to thank Diogo for this very insightful talk once again. And I will pass the floor to maybe Jan, because I think uh, Stan had to leave. Exactly, I think Stan had to leave. Well, let me extend the thanks also to both of you, to uh, Diogo and Eduardo. Thank you for thank you uh, chairing and, and uh, delivering the talk today. Um, so, uh, well, as I just posted in the chat, there will be a talk next week. And just a reminder, it will be on, on Thursday and not on Monday next week. Uh, so it will be on the 4th of March, but at the same time of the day. Uh, and that one will be on the high order numerical methods of fractional diffusion in polygons by uh, Professor Markus Mirlenk from Vienna. Uh, so please feel free to join us again next week. Okay, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Diogo. Uh, thanks, Eduardo. Thank you. Everybody have a nice day or evening or whatever it is in your time zone. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.